Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will continue now with our last session of today, the first day of our five-day Aspen Initiative Berlin Conference, Aspen uh, Artificial Intelligence Conference from Monday to Friday. And this will be our closing uh, talk. It's called Lightning Talks, and we are expecting a lot because after having listened to politicians, to uh, academics, we are now going to the practitioners. They all have experienced something because they built something up. That's what Europe is about. That's what they have experienced. And so I'm very pleased to uh, shortly introduce all of our few participants. But before, I would say that those four, four, um, uh, four institutions and startups, which we will introduce in a moment, are having been either co-founders or founders of startups sharing their experiences with us of starting their businesses, how they applied AI, and what outlook they have as far as practical applications of AI is concerned. And if you read their bios, you will find out that those are incredible success stories which they can all be proud of. So we have four short input statements from each and any one of them. And then we uh, have you, the audience, also give the possibility to put questions forward, which we then will transfer to them. Uh, and please address them either individually or to the whole panel. And uh, that is it for the moment. Anna is the first one I'd like to introduce. Anna Lukasen Herzig is the founder and CEO of Nyris. And this is a visual search machine which gives people a natural way to find what they are looking for. But before I think they need to know what they are looking for. This uh, startup is currently running in 55 countries, uh, representing every continent. Anna studied engineering at the uh, Technical University in Aachen. So let's start with you, Anna, and ask you also, what is uh, so different about what you did than compared to other startups working in the same field? Please, Anna. Many thanks. I am happy to share my screen with you. Hope you can see that. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. <laughs> Great. So yeah, let's get started. Um, so yeah, many thanks for the introduction and happy to, to introduce Nairis to you and tell you a little bit about our story and what we do. Um, so as just said, Nairis is a visual search engine. So we give search the power of sight. And what's uh, what happened so far, if you review how digitalization started, we started with digitalizing books and all the text around. And so, you know, we put like everything into the web, what, what was somehow described. And then we, we uh, discovered or, or developed the engines to search through all the material. And now since a uh, since few years already, uh, we, uh, we massively start to digitalize all the pixels we see around, so all the visual content. And so far, we are not that good in, in analyzing and searching through this visual content. And that's exactly what we aim to do. So we think that the visual world and the visual way of communication is highly needed. And we would like to enable machines to, to communicate visually the same way as we humans do. And we at Nairus um, start with uh, the possibility to search for different objects or parts with just a picture. So this could be an object like that, which is a spare part, and it's really hard to describe what that is if you don't know it. Or a lamp like that, you could imagine it's a lamp. Um, but also describing it the way that it's easy to find it, it's quite hard. And same with this one here. So we help here to find or to, to, to not be in need to find the keywords. And show you as a very short, very short demo here. 
Uh, you can use our engine for many different products. You can you can just snap an object and we find in exactly that speed the result. We always give a result list back. So we never give just one product because we recognize it's better for upselling. You can search pictures through and uh, it's always it's always the speed that you see. So it's it takes less than typing. And um, how how our customers use our product? So most of them use it for spare parts recognition. We are we are in Germany, and the second one is for for product recognition in e-commerce, and especially in spare parts recognition. One uh, special USP of us is that we can derive synthetic pictures out of the CAD models and then feed our engine with those synthetic pictures. Here in the middle, you see one of those synthetic pictures that are almost fully autom automized, automized, automatically generated. So you don't need to, to, to let a designer do it. Um, and then we can set up a visual search index based on those one so that we ready in few days with with digitalizing the entire spare parts catalog of a, of a German plant engineering company. Yeah, so that's what we do. Who do we do it for? Um, a lot of different retailers and engineering companies um, who we are very proud of is IKEA. Um, there we are integrated in almost 50 countries already. And then there are some others where, where we work for other customers. And at IKEA, we are very proud of that because they hardcore tested us versus our competition, versus Google Lens, versus Microsoft, versus Site Slice and all the other uh, startups out there, Clarify, Cotechica. And yeah, we've been a happy winner. And this was not the first time that, that we won an RFP, uh, uh, but this was the last time. So we're very, very happy about it and very happy to, as a team of 30 now, um, to be able to outperform the big guys out there. Yeah, and who is behind Nourish? That's our team. We are very diverse, have a 50-50 gender share in our team and 12 different nations working for Nairis. And yeah, happy to answer all your questions and see all the other uh, awesome pictures. Thank you, Anna. I think this was an incredible presentation of what you do and what your sort of uh, impact on the industry already is. And let me say two things. You just mentioned lightning speed. That's exactly where our title derived from. It's a lightning talk. It might be very speedy. So we can continue in a minute. But let me also add, from a very sort of a con cus customer and consumer point of view, since a couple of months, I have the Vivino application, where you put it on a label of a wine bottle. And amongst thousands of wine bottles, it will exactly tell you what, where it comes from, how it tastes. You might not totally agree with, but it's a ton of information and it's so much fun. Thank you very much for your practical insights. Now we are coming to Pavel, also another incredible story. He was a consultant with Accenture for years and years. And uh, because of his entrepreneurial spirit, his colleagues always asked him, he said, Pavel, why are you not setting up your own business? And he said, no, it's not time yet because I need more powerful computers which uh, artificial intelligence can be used more efficiently. When that came, he started his neuron soundware system. So, Pavel, please tell us a little bit more about your company which says that it can predict failures by looking into machines and listening. How is that working? Pavel, we might have lost you. Wonderful picture, yes. but no Can you sound. Hear me now? Here you are. Yes. Perfect. You're back. Thank you. So, so you are right. So we had um, that discussion about five years ago uh, around how AI will change the world and what what can we do. Um, and we are now profiling um, um, a system which protects machines and business. It's combination of artificial intelligence and industrial IoT device. And we use it to listen to machines to discover a coming mechanic of failures. So uh, it all uh, started uh, uh, in the past when uh, 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 
literally when my friend was sharing his uh, his uh, experience as he was driving uh, his car, he could hear there was some strange noise coming from the engine. Even stop at the service, they didn't find any issue on the onboard computer, so they let him uh, continue driving. And about 100 kilometers later, cylinder broke apart. It blew up the whole engine. It was 10,000 euros damage. And he said he was very lucky because that was two days before the warranty period ends. So, um, so we humans are very good in uh, learning uh, and uh, experienced technicians, they can even understand what the issue is. But common person knows his car, it's spent many hours on different driving conditions so they can pick a small changes if something doesn't operate as it should be. And that's the intuition that we are building in, uh, in computers, in these uh, microcomputers using uh, neural networks. So to our customers, we do offer uh, uh, all-in-one all solution. So it's uh, having uh, uh, from edge computing uh, up to the um, uh, Hertz, which is uh, the, the digital brain uh, understanding acoustics. And we have also NCARD, which is a small gadget you can uh, combine to uh, your uh, any other computers or even mobile phones for data collections. We use these structure bone sensors, which are very sensitive from vibrations, ultrasonic, and they can separate different components of the same machine. Yeah. And we applied uh, our technology in three uh, key use cases. The first one is uh, uh, preventing an unplanned downtown, which is very costly. The second one is uh, to uh, uh, avoid a collateral damage if something is fixed uh, and it's small uh, repair, uh, it's much cheaper than it gets to something which is much more expensive. And the last one, it's uh, we are now also uh, allowing customers to prolong lifespan of some old machines which have no digital interface and we can help the, not just for maintenance but also provide extra visibility how they operate. Yeah. So we have uh, tested our solution many different assets. Uh, uh, like engines, uh, compressors, uh, cranes, pumps, uh, uh, and so on. That's what we are flowing. So we bring to our customers uh, what we call an age of industry 4.0 uh, maintenance. So it's not just um, uh, and collection data or in real time, uh, but also we apply these algorithms which helps uh, to bring alerts in case there is some anomaly detected and uh, uh, that's attention uh, to the service maintenance team to the right uh, machines, yeah. Audio, it's one of the first symptoms you can discover that issue and that's uh, kind of brings also the, the savings uh, uh, in, in long term. So uh, the algorithms itself, uh, typically we have these predictive maintenance, uh, generic, or we build a custom algorithm uh, if uh, we have a specific data sets. We are working with uh, OEMs uh, if they have the machines or with particular partners on developing uh, uh, a customized algorithms. But the general ones can be really trained after a few days of uh, nominal operation of the machines. And here is an example how uh, it looks. So, um, so the uh, the rectangle on the bottom on the left it's the input signal which is being analyzed by AI and about two days in this case before the cylinder was kind of ish damaged, uh, we could recognize this is some strange coming, the algorithm's anomaly scores starts increasing and that send, uh, that's kind of, if it gets the thresholds that when we send the alerts to the customers. So we have uh, some uh, use cases, I'm happy to talk if you'll be interested, or you can just visit our website, ask for demo, uh, but we, uh, we work on uh, uh, captivation uh, detection on pumps and valves. Uh, we have uh, installations in factories uh, on end of line testing uh, when we replace a uh, bit on uh, consistent human judgment with AI algorithms, which is kind of sorting uh, the products. Uh, we have uh, a supervision of uh, a, a robotic line when something breaks, so, uh, then we can inform uh, people to come and, uh, and fix it. Or we are monitoring different assets like uh, these compressors, uh, uh, pumps, valves, uh, uh, turbines, uh, uh, and so on, uh, or with these anomaly detections uh, helping uh, to prevent uh, bigger failures. So uh, our company is all based Prague. Uh, uh, in, uh, uh, we have a couple of colleagues in, uh, in Germany and other countries. 
uh, and uh, you know, happy to talk to you if you are interested more in details. Thank you. Thank you, Karvel Konechny. Uh, I have one short question because uh, most of us still drive gasoline-driven cars. And as far as I remember, I mean, especially the higher-priced cars, BMW, Daimler, Mercedes, Jaguar, or what, promised already 10, 15 years ago that they had cars installed with dozens of sensors which controlled the engine 24-7 which you just say, it's, a, it's an endless control which you are now establishing with AI. So, in a short answer, what is the difference between sensor-controlled uh, engines which we had in the past and what you do? Yeah, so, um, so, so the most biggest uh, change it's, uh, is that we are really analyzing the mechanical behavior. You don't just wait for the maybe change of the temperature which typically in this is extra frictions you need to slow down, or if you have uh, a different, like a, a pressure in exhausting systems. Again, that's uh, something which detects the issue much later than if you are really following the mechanical data, how the machine operates. Yeah, so that's direct signal. It's uh, uh, providing a, a better insight into the mechanical components, how they operate. So you can really track it. Uh, much closer and uh, um, and more precise. Thank you, Pavel. And now to the next success story, Dagmar Schuller, CEO and co-founder of Odd Earring. Dagmar Schuller was the co-founder of Odd Earring, which conducts research in the field of AI, machine learning, and big data for more than a decade. She was coming from a senior vice president position at the international investment of Fubert Burda Media, and is now a CEO working with a lot of other firms and trying to shape the strategy and business development on operations of clients. Dagmar, tell us what is the special specialty of your firm? Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Indeed, uh, our background is very much uh, research driven and very much academic driven and our mission always was to make fiction become reality. So I will share my presentation with you now and show you quickly what we basically have or are supposed to do with Odeering. I hope you can see this. Yes. But I can basically go ahead. So um, with Odeering, we have, as I said, an academic background, a field in effective computing and uh, machine-based audio intelligence or AI-based audio intelligence is not only done for two or three years, we have really about two decades. And the team that founded Odeering was the internationally very renowned machine intelligence and signal processing team of the Technical University of Munich which was internationally very much recognized already for its uh, fundamental work in effective computing audio. That having said, our core part or our core product always was the emotion recognition out of voice in order to enable an intelligent uh, human machine human interaction, especially for the benefit of increasing human well-being. And that is actually what we are doing at Othering. So basically, if we come to the health AI and voice markets, voice biomarkers, that means everything that you can retrieve on not only from what you say, but especially also how, is going to be really groundbreaking news when you, it comes to uh, disrupting machine technology, when you discuss things with the machine, with a robot, but also in human machine human interaction. So not only having the market in view here, what we are doing is something that has been increasingly of importance, especially since the classical speech recognition task, that means what you say, is basically being solved by big companies like Google, Nuance, and Amazon, and has become a commodity. So if you're talking to your personal assistant, or if you're talking to your smartphone, or if you give any type of speech command, this is something that is quite new or basically that you have learned. But what is quite new is the speech analysis. And this is our domain, that what and how, especially how you say something. So voice is actually much more than just the spoken words. If you just think about paralinguistics, for example, if you laugh, if you cry, if you sigh, if you hesitate, 
in your speech. It already gives you a lot of information how the person feels and how the person is perceived on the other end. So what we can retrieve out of the audio signal if it comes to human audio signal are, for example, the speaker traits like the gender, female, male, the nationality, age groups, even some sort of height and uh, identity that we can basically retrieve out of that. That means the voice is a biomarker, similarly like you have a fingerprint or you have your iris scan. We can detect uh, or psychologically uh, perceived Ocean 5, for example, models that will tell uh, you how much uh, neuroticism is in your voice, how empathic you are, how agreeable you talk. We can also detect speaker traits, like for example, if somebody has drunk some alcohol, if you have some fatigue, if you're sleepy, if you have stress or if the cognitive load is too high. We can detect more than 50 states and traits uh, from emotions, meaning we have a more dimensional model, uh, in, especially around valence and arousal, which is psychologically proven based on the appraisal theory, where we can measure anger, happiness, sadness, frustration, and different type of other core emotions. But what I've said here is one thing that is very interesting, where it becomes really interesting is the health area. So what we can detect out of the voice, are uh, especially voice biomarkers that can tell us more around how a person not actually feels, but whether a person, for example, is sick or whether there's some sort of critical health state or trait that we basically should be intensely monitoring. Having said that, this can all be surrounded, of course, if you're uh, analyzing the audio signal, we have just heard a little bit before uh, with regards to the machines. What type of context do you have? That means the environmental sounds that you're surrounded by, but also the social scene, meaning if there's one person or more people talking, how the crowd emotion, for example, is just perceived or whether you have got some sort of critical stage. And what we aim to do with this information is bringing this type of technology to devices, small devices where you only have to use one sensor that is quite cheap, the microphone, and that is almost in every device that you can imagine. So our technology is at the moment at a stage where we already have ready to sell products in that area that have got uh, at least human level detection possibilities, for example, with regards to the emotions and also have products in place that also already have our intelligent context, that means environmental sound detection in place. We do not consider us as a uh, startup anymore, but rather as a scale up. We have the headquarters close to the DLR, in, close to Munich in Germany, and also an office in Berlin. And we work with companies, for example, like uh, Huawei or uh, BMW, Daimler, um, or GN, for example, where uh, uh, the smart sound device of the AV Chakra 85H last year uh, had our technology implemented, was launched, and received. 13 CES awards. Our technology, for example, has also been awarded several times, first time 2017, where we won the International Digital World Cup. We got the Innovation Prize Bavaria, we won the Vision Award, and we also won the VDE Award, just to name a few. So humanity, with regards to the voice biomarkers, um, is a very interesting part. That means we focus around the human being. For us, the patient or the user, whatever is really centric, and also the individual needs are really centric. So uh, voice biomarkers in our area have increasing accuracy since we receive more data and can validate and pre-train the models. We can detect anomalies, for example, in speech, dysfunctionalities, changes, whatever makes the signal a little bit different. And especially this is interesting for neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's in order to detect them quite early and in order to also enhance therapy, but also neurocognitive or psychological diseases or voice diseases. The possibility that we have here with this very holistic approach where we come from the whole audio scene, go down to the social scene and go down to the individual allows us also to track the implications, for example, of the social scene that might be stressful for the individual or, for example, noise in, noise environments that also might be stressful for the individual. That allows us also to retrieve information with regards to individualization, what the person really wants, also supports self-assessment and delivers a lot of information with regards to diagnosis and the validation. 
So what we have is already our device technology, which is scalable, which we can already implement, or which is available as a web API, but also a, a mobile SDK and wearables and hearables, and uh, basically has a classical license system in the back. So um, this is also a very nice solution for implementation since it solves a lot of data protection issues. You know that personal data, especially the voice, is a very personal data, um, should not maybe be delivered to everybody or to some uh, clouds. So we basically had uh, from the beginning the solution that, if, especially if it's health related, the data must stay under the control of the user and of the patient. And this is why we have developed the device technology. That means, the device receives a ground model that has been trained by us, but the individual data basically trains the model to adapt to the individual person and um, stays on the, uh, on, the mic, uh, on the phone or on the device where it's implemented. So there is no um, scary solution that your data is driven out to somewhere where you cannot control it, but you have it on your device and you only share, for example, with your therapist or with your physician, the data that you really want to share. And uh, we work with feature extraction in order to enhance our models and also with federated machine learning as a solution in order to overcome the data protection issues. Our last, last project that I want to introduce you to so that you get a glimpse what we can do is the AI Sound Lab, our fight AI against Corona. We've recently launched it. And uh, this is an app that will be able to detect and monitor COVID-19. So recently, MIT or also Carnegie Mellon have uh, already showed with their work that uh, a COVID-19 detection from coughing uh, should be possible. We've been working the last six months on this and also have published the very first paper on audio analysis for COVID-19 late March already, based on data that we received from Wuhan and also from the University of Augsburg from early corona patients. And our um, uh, approach to this is a little bit further than just forced coughing into the microphone. We want to detect um, COVID out of the speech and the sound event. We combine both things so that we also have a tracker for validation in additional ways. And also if people are asymptomatic with regards to coughing, it should still be working. We currently have already the ground modules or ground uh, uh, basically models that uh, detect uh, on a very good 80% accuracy. We are quite confident that we can train them uh, better and that we, uh, that we will get around 90% or even higher in the accuracy for those type of predictive modelings. And uh, basically for that, we introduced the AI Sound Lab as a data donation platform where I will, uh, or I can only ask everybody to please uh, donate some data, even if you're healthy. So we are searching for healthy and COVID patients. And what we received in the past couple of days, a couple of thousand uh, data donations already that have valid data. Based on that, we aim to release this type of app at the, in the first quarter of 2021. Basically, from a setup perspective, AI Sound Lab is set up as a web app and also a native app where we have uh, the possibilities not to only have a sound voice test that can be done daily, but also a current monitoring of different sound events like the coughing or sneezing if you, for example, monitor this through your uh, sleep. So that is what Adhering is doing. And uh, with my or from my perspective, I think that this type of technology will be very much in almost every Every device in the next uh, 10 years in order to basically improve personal well-being. Thank you very much. Dagmar, thank you very much and I would like to add a short question. First of all, I would like to volunteer as a guinea pig for your research. Thank you. <laughs> Number two, uh, welcome. I'm a little bit wondering because I think uh, recognition of noises or, or let's say cough is a very easy thing. But leveling, uh, sort of recognizing the level of anger, you need some reference points and you need sort of a scalable structure. And can you a little bit elaborate on that? Where do you take those reference points from? Because I think people react very differently. Some are very loud and others are very uh, silent, but they still can uh, voice their anger in different ways. Yes. 
basically we have the human annotators and as the ground truth for this type of modeling. So the emotion recognition has, as I said, more dimensions. You have different type of dimensions and basically or the point where it's set more or less on this type of dimensions uh, comprises together for the emotion that is recognized. So for example, if you are highly aroused and you have a very a negative valence, you would be quite angry. Yeah, that uh, would be in a two-dimensional setup, a uh, uh, very easy to understand concept. We have got different type of dimensions also that regard, for example, the loudness, that regard, for example, the intensity. And basically, as I said, our uh, main focus point of ground truth is the human. So we have got human annotators that label this type of data for us on those dimensions. And uh, based on this, a ground model is developed. And also we have got active learning in this annotation process so that basically the machine learns also how to best annotate this type of uh, emotion. And at the moment, our accuracy levels are a little bit above human recognition already. We've got between 70 and 75% of human traces recognizing different type of emotions at the moment. So basically, if you know somebody better, you would rather recognize how this person is. If you don't know somebody that well, you just have the initial thing how you would recognize is this person angry or not. Thank you. Depending on that, we have, as I said, uh, we are a little bit above human rating already with the machine because it's presented with much more data than a normal person is in uh, dis uh, discussing information with somebody else. Thank you very much, Dagmar. Let's come to our next speaker, Leif Nissen Lundbeck. He's the co-founder and CEO of the technology company Xine AG. His work focuses mainly on algorithms and applications for privacy-preserving artificial intelligence. Uh, he has a, a astounding and very impressive academic career with a Master of Sciences uh, Software Engineering of the University of Oxford, a Master of Science in Mathematics of Heidelberg University and a PhD of computing. I mean, what more can you do in the field of IT, digital intelligence and AI? So, Life, tell us a little bit about what you are trying to achieve or what you already have achieved. Please, Life. Sure, yeah. Uh, many thanks for being here. I hope uh, you can also see my presentation, right? Yes, we can. Thank yeah. you. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, um, I mean, actually, uh, the last presentation from Dagmar was a, a perfect uh, <laughs> introduction already um, uh, to what we do, uh, and also some things were mentioned already there, um, because, well, I mean, we've talked a lot about AI in general, and, um, of course, uh, AI in general, uh, and, I mean, you, I think, also got the impression, uh, requires a lot of data, and in very many uh, situations, we also... Um, have the issue that um, this data is actually coming from private people. So there's, of course, a lot of concerns um, around um, privacy in general. And also, we can see that um, there's kind of like this AI privacy dilemma, and we even call this AI convenience dilemma, because AI is, of course, um, a convenience privacy dilemma, because, of course, AI is used in order to achieve a certain convenience for example, if we recognize um, speech, if we recognize um, images in order to find um, uh, better images or um, describe th certain things, for example. Um, and actually, most applications are like that. The problem, of course, in this kind of case is that this data is coming from private people in many situations. And many people, of course, are concerned what happens to their data. So if we, for example, restrict the um, handing over to data, we can, of course, not really very well train um, such uh, AI systems. And we end up in this kind of dilemma. And this is exactly what we want to solve um, with technology. Because there's a lot of solutions around uh, governance, for example. I mean, many people have heard, for example, about Gaia-X uh, here in Europe. And also there's a lot of complaints about, oh, Europe has so high um, privacy standards, for example, or ethical standards in general, and we cannot compete against um, the US or we cannot compete against China, where all of this data is kind of usable for anyone. So um, we think this is not very true, and there is actually a technical solution to this AI privacy dilemma. So, for example, um, in this kind of voice assistant case, um, which we also have just heard, we um, have heard also, or we've seen uh, in the past, a lot of uh, problematic cases where, of course, um, large companies like, for example, Amazon are kind of 
um, exploiting um, the data of private people in order to further train, of course, um, their uh, voice assistants. Uh, and of course, they have to do this also in order to deliver a greater convenience, in order to recognize better um, what uh, an individual human being is actually saying here. Uh, and of course, they um, uh, they want to do this in order to sell, of course, uh, more products. Um, but the problem here is, of course, that this individual data from people is analyzed actually by human beings also and stored somewhere uh, at these companies. And they can also uh, potentially um, harm you because they can find out different things. They could, of course, also misuse this kind of data. So we end up again in this kind of um, privacy uh, convenience dilemma. But how can we actually tackle and solve this kind of dilemma? We think we can solve this dilemma in a technical way, where instead of this common way of bringing the data to a central algorithm or a central database where you actually apply the algorithm in order to train a model, we can rather leave the data where it is in the end devices or the edge devices such as smartphones um, or speakers, for example, and rather bring the algorithm to the data itself and train it where it is. And instead of then just doing nothing, we combine these algorithms in a clever way and also in a privacy-preserving way, because this procedure is not privacy-preserving per se. Of course, um, if we only take the algorithms, we still have the problem that we can infer back from what an individual local model has learned and re-engineer the underlying data set very easily. So what we've developed is an open source framework, which is called XaneNet, which applies masked federated learning in a very scalable way. So we can, it's specifically um, designed for edge devices to train local AI models on, for example, smartphones or browser, browser environments um, or other edge devices, like for example, cars and masking these models then with homomorphic encryption. And rather than taking the raw models, we only take the encrypted models with keeping the underlying information intact and aggregate these encrypted models into an encrypted global model, which redistribute um, in an, uh, to the individual edge devices in order to have these kind of training rounds. So uh, this was mentioned, for example, also by Dagmar, that this leads to a much more privacy preserving way of training uh, such um, models. And we have the advantage that we can keep the convenience that we gain from AI, but we can also stay very privacy-preserving. So we, for example, tested this um, in many different ways and also published some um, publications here. Uh, and just as a quick note for, for example, speech recognition, we achieved almost the same accuracy as if we had all of the data in a central place. So what we try to achieve with our um, framework is that actually anyone can simply train on edge devices, privacy-preserving and also convenient AI models while not actually interfering with the data of your users. So this is what we're here for, and we aim to kind of overcome this kind of trade-off between privacy and convenience and make also privacy-preserving AI available for everyone. So, um, so it's basically integratable very easily into um, edge devices and into training procedures on edge devices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leibniz. And I think it looks like, or at least if listening to you, it looks like that you have found the solution to so many of our headaches and problems. Let's tackle that question a little bit about privacy and uh, the, the, the question uh, how different we are from the US. You know that the discussion in the United States at the moment tends more in the direction of Europe. They are trying to limit sort of the open access to data, uh, especially as far as the big five are concerned. Uh, and Europe has maybe, uh, if your model will be applied, uh, don't even need to change its rules because maybe you have found a third way. So where, where can we both merge the two from the European side and the American side? Is there a middle way? Well, we think actually that um, we should um, rather than, I mean, focusing on what the US is doing or what China is doing, rather go really our own way here, uh, like a European way where we have these high standards and where we can actually, um, well, keep everything um, from the, well, I mean, uh, legal framework as it is, and rather really focus on going our own way of building basically our own systems with our own standards. Well, I mean, you mentioned um, the U.S. here and, um, well, I mean, for the U.S. it depends a bit. I mean, it's uh, very different from state to state. Um, so, for example, we have California, which is going actually in a 
very aggressive um, way compared to other states in the US in terms of um, privacy, I mean, for privacy protection, while we have other states in the US that are actually going the opposite way. So uh, for the US, it, it, it really depends on. And um, I think in Europe, we have the advantage here that we have like an overall uh, legal framework. However, we also have differences between the states um, or the, the, the countries here. Um, but I think really that this kind of problem should be solved with technology rather than pure governance, because governance frameworks are not scalable. You have to set it up for um, each case again and again. Um, while with this kind of technology, um, you can actually kind of copy it and you can, I mean, we, we enable it also basically as a, as, a, as a framework really for all sorts of applications. Of course, not, not every applications there, every application there is, um, there is certain constraints. However, um, I think it is very well solvable in a scalable well through, uh, way through technology. There's another question uh, which goes in the same direction, and I think all of you in your businesses need big data, either for, for visual recognition or for audio recognition. You need data to work with. And here's the question, how big of a disadvantage is Europe's focus on data protect, pr pr protection for the EU's ability to compete in the e AI race? Uh, who wants to chime in and answer that question? Okay, Dagmar, please. I would like to. So uh, the current disadvantage, uh, in my opinion, is quite big. Not when it comes to machine data, but when it comes to personalized data. We have uh, to find completely different solutions in our end uh, in order to get the data that, for example, in China is available quite quickly. And um, we have to have a lot of administrative things in order to fulfill the data protection. Also, even with a solution that we have in place that we can get the data and that we inform the people. Um, I think it is necessary to make a big change, not to basically cut security or any type of protection for the user, but to have a different type of thinking when it comes to the user. The user has to basically the, uh, see that the possibility for us is the data to train also models on their behalf for their benefit with those protection in mind that we are having. Yeah, But we cannot do that if we are restricted on every level. And this will drive the momentum rather in the US or also, for example, in China with competitive solutions that have the possibility to at the moment be better because they are presented with more data. And the risk that we are having here is that actually we get what we really, really not want. A solution that is better but does not serve our protection standards that we want. So we have to get back and basically talk to the people in order to get a not that strict view on data protection and enable especially research and also companies that work for the human being. So here is a question. Life, I think you, you made a skeptical expression on your face. So you're not agreeing with Dagmar, right? Uh, no, not quite. I mean, it depends really on. Uh, I mean, I can totally uh, see this view. Um, uh, however, I disagree. Um, so I think we can actually, um, through technology, really have uh, a solution to that, um, and I mean, we, we've also shown this multiple times, um, and, and this is also what many companies have to do now, um, and they have to find a technical way in order to face this challenge, and I don't think that we have to give up um, um, our view also and our legal standards for personalized data. And um, I mean, for example, uh, in my um, past research, I've shown how easy it is even from a model to infer back from uh, to individual people. Uh, so I am very, very skeptical of that. And also, I mean, when it comes to Chinese or U US um, applications, well, um, I mean, we also show, I mean, we also as a company demonstrate that we can build such systems um, that are basically as convenient as the US um, counterparts here with even a lot less data. Because of course, it's a, it's a very easy solution to just have a lot of data and um, to not really take much care about um, how you process this data and uh, or where you process this data and so on. Um, but I think that we have in Europe, especially like the power of engineering and creative thinking about uh, how we can solve and tackle these solutions, plus that we have a lot of very nice um, and good solutions on the technical side that actually um, 
well, solve this kind of trade-off between using data and um, keeping basically the data private enough. And um, and I think um, that, for example, I mean, Dagmar, you mentioned that, um, uh, well, you have to ask basically for the consent and so on. Well, uh, I mean, there is even technical solutions to not necessarily do that if you really protect the data enough and if you process the data enough um, and protect also the models enough. So I think, um, well, I mean, we can actually very much achieve the same things, but we have to be also brave enough to go our own way here instead of just basically complaining that we cannot do the same. But I think, for example, your company is an excellent example of that you can actually achieve something like that um, and even basically in Europe, right? Um, because you have like really also on your side the power of engineering and creative thinking and research. So, um, yeah. Now I see a skeptical Pavel. Pavel, I think <laughs> you want to, to add something? Please. One Go reason ahead. why we are listening to mechanical devices because they don't have a lawyer. They, there is no privacy issue. There is no banking secret. We don't care. Like we cannot be recording machines anywhere on the globe. It operates the same, and I'm very happy about it. Yeah, because I'm I'm feeling that we are a bit like I'm so annoyed that every website is asking for cookies acceptation, and and European law re, re, requires that I give not a general consensus. I need to give consensus every single page. Yeah, and what's the good of it? If somebody really wants to be in private, just use incognito mode to every browser and that's it. Yeah. We are bottling ourselves. We are making it much harder. And it's really ridiculous because if you go and ask hospital for, let's say, um, a chest x rays, they cannot share it with you because they don't have a written consensus that uh, they can use data for, for anything else than treating the patients. Even anonymized, you cannot use it for training or for any recognitions of lung, uh, uh, cancer, lung cancer. So these algorithms will be developed in China, in Austria, uh, Australia, in the uh, in US, and we'll be just buying this as a service because we will restrict ourselves, uh, I think, unnecessarily. Yeah, I think there might be a better way how to do it. Uh, we can do uh, something much simpler uh, and definitely anonymize data if they will be uh, available. I think that's something which will be okay to be used. Yeah. That's my perspective. Pavel, uh, I, I see you now, you both want to join in, but let me just say one thing. You didn't mention COVID-19 until uh, to this very moment where I tried to introduce it, because we all found out that data protection was hindering us in merging the, the necessary data to find quick solutions. Maybe it was not even the laws, but in practicability, we didn't sort of achieve a higher level of collaboration and and cooperation amongst institutions in the health business. And that's where we are today. So Anna, maybe you have also something to add? Please, go ahead, yes. then live. So, so first of all, I think everybody has a point here, yeah, and we need to find, we need to find the right measures, but to give a very pragmatic uh, um, opinion why life is very right um, uh, in, in a very easy way. So in our case, data privacy is very important as well because our and first of all our customers pointed us to that and and one of the very first was Lidl and they said like okay guys everything is fine and we love your tech but imagine there are naked kids um, on the sitting on a chair that somebody would like to search for and you get those pictures uh, and then um, it's just you know it's your responsibility to care about this material. And everyone knows that a smartphone picture has all the information connected to that smartphone picture, including the geolocation. Means uh, there are some people in the net looking for some pictures of naked babies and kids, and they, got the, they get the geolocation connected to the picture as well. So that's like, yeah, we, we can all imagine what could happen after. Yeah, And you, you as a company, you don't wanna be responsible for that. And you don't want to make your customers responsible for that. So we very, very early developed measures how to deal with that. Uh, 
yeah, we first of all kick out all the connected data. So we don't even get it on our server. We kick it out in the in the mobile device already. Yeah, so on the SDK. Yeah, so then then we mask all the faces. We automatically detect the faces and mask it. And four hours after we receive the the pictures, we delete them. So we don't we can't we can't access them anymore. And those are very easy measures. But then my next point comes. In the RFPs we do versus where we pitch versus Google versus Alibaba versus all the others, we are the only one who have answers to those questions. So now this is exactly like life says. Now it turns to be our USP because we have the processes and the measures how to deal with that, and that's yeah, that's quite cool. Maybe life before I give you the floor, uh, there was another question which goes in the same direction. Uh, there is a question uh, re referring to Jan Tallinn at his uh, introductory conversation uh, uh, by saying that vast data sources are no longer needed in advancing AI technology. He said a simple basic training set is enough to set the whole process in motion. That goes a little bit along the line what you said live. Is that true or is it an overstatement? Yeah, I, I actually totally agree. Um, so I will also give an example for that later. But um, first of all, I mean, saying that, I mean, I totally agree to um, what has been said here. But the problem is really um, that also if those companies want to sell in Europe, they should follow our ethical standards. I mean, why should we follow everyone else's ethical standards um, just in order to compete against some kind of benchmark or metric or so that actually comes out of nowhere. And um, I think, um, well, I mean, you mentioned, for example, COVID-19. Um, well, it's not actually a failure of data privacy here or law. It's actually a failure of governments working together, of technical systems working together. And it's a failure of um, actually um, a lot of systems having slept especially um, um, hospitals, for example, um, for, for years or decades. And um, I mean, their IT infrastructure is simply not capable of um, using privacy preserving technologies. And um, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's also, uh, I mean, it's of course, I mean, they can now point towards um, uh, privacy measures or so, but I mean, what hospital is actually capable of using AI technology in order to train, for example, certain models um, in order to, um, for example, predict um, the level of coughing or so. Um, so therefore, um, uh, I mean, it's, 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 I think it's like a ridiculous uh, com discussion, I mean, to point towards only privacy or so. It's, I think it's a, it's a combination of multiple things here. And um, technically, uh, and also legally, I think we are uh, capable of solving these, um, these problems um, easily, actually, if we really want to, and if we also are brave enough here in Europe. And I think um, many things also point towards the right direction. I mean, there have been, for example, I mean, Germany, I think, was... Um, relatively effective in um, combining uh, data privacy and, for example, um, uh, this Corona app, of course, I mean, it's not really AI or so and or advanced data analysis. And it also took a lot of time. Um, but I think this is not really um, a failure really of data privacy. And actually, even US companies were forcing us in order to go uh, in this kind of distributed direction. I mean, we oft also have to point uh, towards this. Um, also, I agree to um, that not every problem is actually a big data problem. A lot of problems are small data problems now. So, for example, um, we will, for example, uh, launch tomorrow a product um, which uh, is exactly having this kind of um, problem where in order to stay privacy preserving, um, uh, we actually rather had a small data problem than a big data problem. And many AI problems are small data problems. Um, uh, if you really think about it and if you really want to stay privacy preserving. Um, and um, so therefore, yeah, I th as I said, I mean, it's, I think it's easy to just um, dump a lot of data to an algorithm in order to train it. But whether this is really meaningful is another question. Thank you, Life. I think I take this as a final argument and a wide spanning argument. Uh, and we have to finish the first day of our AI week here. I thank the panelists very much. We started sort of a from a marketplace of practical, of practical applications of AI. And we came, no doubt and no wonder, we came to big data and we also came to ethics and what we can do about to also live up to the high expectations as far as 
necessary, maybe management and regulations of AI are concerned. Thank you for your wide-spanning remarks, for a lot of insights. That was a great first day. And let me say to all of our audience and spectators, uh, you all are expected to join us again tomorrow at 3 p.m. sharp. And you will watch then a conversation with Saskia Esken, co-chair of SPD and member of the German parliament. You can also expect a panel discussion on labor in the time of automation, automation and also a presentation by Michael Betoncourt, author of The Critique of Digital Capitalism, one of the issues we will also tackle throughout the week. So I say thank you to all of you ex again to our panelists and I say good night and good luck and hope to see you tomorrow again, 3 p.m. sharp. Thank you.